The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Part 14. I'll rest on the next turn as he goes out. Is it? I feel much better. Then in two or three turns more, I will have him. His straw hat was far on the back of his head, and he sank down into the bow with the pull of the line as he felt the fish turn. You work now, fish, he thought. I'll take you as to turn. The sea had risen considerably, but it was a fair weather breeze, and he had to have it to get home. I'll just steer south and west, he said. A man is never lost at sea, and it is a long island. It was on the third turn that he saw the fish first. He saw him first as a dark shadow that took so long to pass under the boat that he could not believe its length. No, he said, he can't be that big. But he was that big, and at the end of this circle, he came to the surface only thirty yards away. And the old man saw his tail out of water. It was higher than a big scythe blade, and a very pale lavender above the dark blue water. It raked back as the fish swam just below the surface. The old man could see his huge bulk and the purple stripes that bended him. His dorsal fin was down, and his huge pectorals were spread wide. On this circle, the old man could see the fish's eye and the two great sucking fish that swam around him. Sometimes they attached themselves to him. Sometimes they darted off. Sometimes they would swim easily in his shadow. They were each over three feet long. And when they swam fast, they lashed their whole body like eels. The old man was sweating now, but from something else besides the sun. On its calm, placid turn to fish mate, he was gaining line, and he was sure that in two turns more he would have a chance to get the harpoon in. But I must get him close, close, close. He thought, I mustn't try for the hit. I must get the heart. Be calm and strong, old man," he said. On the next circle, the fish back was out, but he was a little too far from the boat. On the next circle, he was still too far away, but he was higher out of water, and the old man was sure that by gaining some more line, he could have him alongside. He had rigged his harpoon long before, and his coil of light rope was in a round basket, and the end was made fast to the bit in the bow. The fish was coming in on his circle now, calm and beautiful looking, and only his great tail moving. The old man put on him all that he could to bring him closer. For just a moment, the fish turned a little on his side. Then he straightened himself and began another circle. I moved him, the old man said. I moved him then. He felt faint again now, but he held on the great fish all the strain that he could. I moved him, he thought. Maybe this time I can get him over. Pull hands, he thought. Hold up legs. Last for me, head. Last for me. You never went. This time I'll pull him over. But when he pulled all of his effort on, starting it well out before the fish came alongside, and pulling with all his strength, the fish pulled part away over, and then righted himself and swam away. Fish, the old man said, "Fish, you're going to have to die anyway." Do you have to kill me too? That way, nothing is accomplished. He thought. His mouth was too dry to speak, but he could not reach for the water now. I must get him alongside this time. He thought. I am not good for many more turns. 
Yes, you are, he told himself. You're good forever. On the next turn, he nearly had him, but again the fish righted himself and swam slowly away. You are killing me, fish, the old man thought, but you have a right to. Never have I seen a greater or more beautiful or a calmer or more noble thing than you, brother. Come on and kill me. I do not care who kills who. Now you are getting confused in the head, he thought. You must keep your head clear. Keep your head clear and know how to suffer like a man or a fish, he thought. Clear up head. He said in a voice he could hardly hear, "Clear up." Twice more, it was the same undertones. I don't know. The old man thought he had been on the point of feeling himself go each time. I do not know, but I will try it once more. He tried it once more, and he felt himself going when he turned to fish. The fish righted himself and swam off again slowly, with the great tail weaving in the air. I'll try it again, the old man promised. Although his hands were mushy now, and he could only see well in flashes, he tried it again, and it was the same. So he thought, and he felt himself going before he started. I will try it once again. He took all his pain and what was left of his strength, and his long gone pride, and he put it against the fish's agony. And the fish came over onto his side, and swam gently on his side. His bill almost touching the planking of the skiff, and started to pass the boat, long, deep, white, silver, and barred with purple, and interminable in the water. The old man drops the line, and put his foot on it, and lifted the harpoon as high as he could, and drove it down with all his strength and more strength he had summoned into the fish's side, just behind the great chest fin that rose high in the air to the altitude of the man's chest. He felt the iron go in, and he leaned on it and drove it further, and then pushed all his weight after it. Then the fish came alive, with his death in him, and rose high out of the water, showing all his great length and width, and all his power and his beauty. He seems to hang in the air above the old man in the skiff. Then he fell into the water with a crash that sent spray over the old man and over all of the skiff. The old man fell faint and sick. And he could not see well, but he clears the harpoon line and let it run slowly through his raw hands. And when he could see, he saw the fish was on his back with his silver belly up. The shaft of the harpoon was projecting at an angle from the fish's shoulder, and the sea was discoloring with the red of the blood from his heart. First, it was dark as a shoal in the blue water that was more than a mile deep. Then it spread like a cloud. The fish was silvery and still, and floated with the waves. The old man looked carefully in the glimpse of vision that he had. Then he took two turns of the harpoon line around the bit in the bow, and hit his head in his hands. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part fourteen, to be continued in part fifteen. If you like this story, please like, share, and subscribe. See you then.